Hey there, my name is Henry, and I'd like to welcome you to the first of many videos from Henry's Technical Tutoring. On this channel, I will cater towards helping those interested in Linux systems and networking, be that about how to set up your own Linux desktops, servers, useful open source software, building virtualized environments, network design, administration, and network management software, as well as other relevant topics. First, a little bit about myself. I've been working in the telecommunications industry for over 20 years now, in a variety of roles, and have a wide range of experience to draw on as a result. During this time, I've worked as a senior network engineer, a systems engineer, and as a DevOps engineer. I'm a daily user and, prop and proponent of open source software, and will try to find alternatives to closed source software wherever possible. To start off with, I thought I'd do a video about configuring your own web content filtering solution to block inappropriate content from children or employees in a home or enterprise environment. Today we'll be taking a look at a filtering web proxy server that's very flexible and has been around for a while called E2Guardian. One of its most powerful features which keeps it relevant is that it offers man-in-the-middle SSL interception. This means it's able to inspect encrypted web traffic. Given that the vast majority of websites deliver content now with HTTPS, having the ability to filter this traffic is important. Aside from being able to block content based on phrases found within the website payload, E2Guardian also has the ability to block access based on domain, URL matching, and a variety of other techniques. This gives you a lot of flexibility in defining what you want to block and how. In addition to the existing rule sets, you can also write your own, and you can combine E2Guardian with a DNS blocking service such as the Pi-Hole project for added security. To build this project, you, don't, you need to have access to a Linux server on your local network. You don't need much horsepower to make this happen. Even an older Intel i5 system would be fine and can be found on eBay for less than $100. Examples of these would be the Lenovo M9X series systems or the Dell Optiplex series systems. To start with, we'll assume you have a computer to use. It can be either a system like what I just described, or if you have your own home lab, you can also just create a virtual machine to host the E2 Guardian software on. For this build, we're going to be using the Ubuntu 18.04 server distribution. This is mainly for ease of setup, since E2Guardian has Debian packages, one of which has been built for Ubuntu 18.04. The first part of the process is to visit the E2Guardian website at e2guardian.org. From here, you'll see a download link. It'll take you to a page with a link to GitHub. And on the GitHub page, you'll see that the current release is 5.3.4 as of the time of this video, which was updated you know, not too long ago, a few months ago. And at the bottom there, there's a link for patches for Debian and Ubuntu. If we open this up, we'll see version 5.3 here. And then we simply just go to the E2 Ubuntu Bionic version of the Debian package and copy the link location. Now we can head over to our server and we can do a wget and pull down that package file. Now we need to just do a quick little installation first of two dependencies. Uh, if we don't do this, we'll get yelled at. I'm just going to jump up to root for all this stuff anyway, since it's easier that way. And then we will run a apt install lib tom math1 and lib event pthreads-2.1-6. So these are our two dependencies that we require for E2Guardian. After those are installed, we can install the Debian package for E2Bionic or each of you Ubuntu underscore Bionic, sorry. <laughs> and this is going to actually set up a user and a group, as well as like start the actual service up. So if we do a service E2 Guardian status, we should see it's running. And if we do a netstat dash LNTUP grep E2 Guardian, we'll see it's listening as well. So it's running. Great. The next step is to begin configuration. So, one of the first things to do is to create our SSL uh, location where we're going to store our certificates. So, we'll just do an mkdir-p etc e2guardian ssl slash generated certs. So, we need to create two directories here, obviously the SSL directory that wasn't there before, and also inside of it generated certs. That's where e2guardian will store, first off, an SSL 
That's where we're going to put the search that we will use for our clients to talk to E2Guardian. And inside of generated certs, that's where E2Guardian will temporarily save certificates that generates or that it retrieves rather from websites that it visits that have HTTPS service. So we'll do that and then we will rename it to the E2Guardian user and the group. And then there we go. It's now E2Guardian user and E2Guardian group. We'll then change directory into that location and start building our, our various files for our cert and our keys, or our certs and our key. So the first thing to do is to generate a private key. Private root.pem. There we go. That's going. And we'll generate a request for a public certificate. And we'll get an, give it an expiry time of 10 years because why not? We trust it, don't we? Private root.pem, and we will do output to my root ca.crt. Oh dear, I typoed somewhere. Days, right? It's not one day, it's multiple days. All right, country, I'm going to put my stuff in Canada, Ontario, Toronto. You can do whatever you like for this, really. Home lab. Organization, we leave blank. This one we should actually set to the IP address of our server and then leave this blank. There we go. That's all you really need. You can obviously define like like real stuff there if you're going into like a, maybe a corporate environment or enterprise environment and you want this to look official if anyone actually looks. And then finally, we will generate our private key or sorry, our private cert. We already made a private key. And there we have it. Now we will make sure we reown this stuff again to the E2 Guardian user and the group. And then we can begin configuration changes to the E2 Guardian comp files. So first thing we'll do is edit the e2guardian.comp file. And uh, we want to search first for enable SSL. Set that to on. Then we want to go down to our certs here. So we just need to change these paths, so we'll change anything that matches to home e2 and e2 install with a bit of regex. We'll just match that little string there. And we'll change that to etc e2 guardian using escapes to not confuse things, SSL. And that should change all those. Perfect. And we'll just remove the comments here from these different files. And uh, let's see here. Uh, get to the end of the line. Get that out of there. Now we need, to just we need to specify our public certificate file. Next, we need to specify the private key. And lastly, we need to specify the private key. I'm sorry, the private cert. My bad. Okay, and then we want to just adjust uh, transparent. This is an optional thing. I just do it because I find it easier. You can, by default, it'll listen on 8080 and 8443 for HTTP and HTTPS. So you can leave it that way, or you can combine it into one 8080 only, which is what I usually do. And there we go. We've configured the, the main config file. Now we'll just adjust the filtering configuration file. So the first thing to change actually is this line here for weighted phrase mode. Um, you want to set this either to one or two. There's uh, zero is off. One is going to basically whenever a bad word comes up, the way each guardian functions is each word has a score. So some words may have a higher value, others a lower value. The higher the value, the, the worse the word is. So as you can see beneath here, there is a naughtiness limit, which you can define based on like, you know, how soon you want it to block or whatever. Um, so when it's, when it's at a one for weighted phrase mode, a word that appears, say, like five times with a weight of 50 is going to result in a page score of 250 for that one word. If there's other words as well, they'll add to the page score. If the word, if we set this to two, though, it's only going to count the word once, regardless of how many times it appears. 
So if the, a word that's worth 50 appears five times, the page score will not be 250, it will be 50. So that's just why we changed that. And the other thing to change in this file is the SSL man in the middle configuration directive. We'll set that to on. And with that, we should be able to now restart E2 Guardian. And that will make our changes take effect. The next thing to do here is we need to take our public cert file that we created so we can copy this over to our client computers. I'll copy that into my home directory. And then I don't need to do anything else at this point in the server. The server is now ready and our config file is available for us to download more or less. You can either do it this way and just SFTP into the systems as I'm going to do. Or you can... Uh, you know, copy that cert file contents onto like a USB stick and walk around the house or the office and just start installing it in computers. So we'll log in here to our server, accept that little SSH certificate or fingerprint, sorry. And we'll copy our my root CA file to our documents directory for our local user. We're done now with WinSCP. We can close that. The next thing we'd want to do here is to edit these options in Firefox. That's, I guess, the browser we're using today just to set this up on. Obviously, you can do this on multiple browsers, so don't feel you have to use Firefox or anything for this to work. And if we go into View, Search, and Import, we'll be presented with our Documents directory where, where we copied the cert to. We can open it, and this will now present a little dialog. And you want to basically enable this one option here to trust this CA to identify websites. If you don't do this, it's not going to work. And just hit OK there. And now we've imported the cert. It'll show up here if we scroll down. I called mine Home Lab, so there you go. Hit OK there. Let's set that option up. The next thing to do is to change the proxy settings. So we'll search for proxy, hit settings. And in settings here, we'll set manual proxy configuration. As you can see, you can also use system proxy settings, so you can set that up. But uh, yeah, this, this is easier for our little demonstration here. I'll choose port 8080. This is actually why I do it for one port, mainly because I just click this little button, and it populates, and there you go. Makes no real difference. And hit OK again there. And there we have it. This is now configured. At this point, we can start to test out our browsing. So if we go to, say, Google, we can search for something like rabbits. And, you know, it's fine. It works. What if we search for something that E2 Guardian is going to block by default? The default rules, the main one it includes, of course, is for pornography. So if we search for porn and hit enter, it will be presented with a block page. This is what the page looks like by default. As you can see, this is a bit uh, warped. It's uh, <laughs> the URL, of course, here is massive, so and it transitions that down into the page. So you get this huge, wide page. Uh, again, this is all open source, so you can edit how this appears. You can remove that if you like, and it won't do things like this. Put your company logo there and whatever else, or maybe a picture of you shaking your finger at your kids. So. Anyways, uh, this is what you'll get if you go to search a, a bad thing. And if we obviously go back to rabbits, it's fine. We can look at rabbits all the time. So, um, little things to consider. So, E2 Guardian is only going to work if it's being used. If your users are smart enough to go around that proxy setting and either disable it or maybe they have the um, ability to bring their own computer to the network, if it depends on like your office or your environment, then they could, could get around things that way. So one thing I would recommend doing is to look at setting up a separate LAN. Uh, just put a new VLAN up if you can do that. And define some policies for that LAN so that uh, direct access to HTTP and HTTPS resources on the internet is blocked. That'll prevent this from happening. If they don't use the proxy, they can't browse. Uh, the other thing to th think about is if you're in an environment where it's like active directory controlled, you may be able to set policies to enforce use of a proxy on the approved web browsing software that's installed in the client machines. So that's another way to enforce this action, basically. So 
yeah, this is uh, this has been a nice little tour here, so this should be enough to get you started with E2 Guardian. In coming videos, we'll look at creating our own custom rules to block or allow different types of content and sites, and to take a look at time-based blocks and exceptions. So obviously with this, you can do exceptions for different things. One example of that would be like, you know, you pr should probably exempt, say, bank websites to make sure you're not actually intercepting and decrypting people's bank transactions because, I don't know, there might be a law against that or something, or if people know this is going on, they might get upset with you, for instance. So, uh, yeah, um, we'll also take a look at uh, some of the ways I mentioned and how to prevent this uh, from being bypassed. So by creating like your own, say, like custom firewall rules to block this traffic out for those that may need some help with that. Or uh, the other thing that we'll look at too is to mix in the DNS-based block lists, such as with the PyHole project, as that can augment this and add an additional layer of security or control over what content users can consume while they're on your network. But yeah, uh, be sure to like and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this one, and uh, feel free to leave any suggestions for other topics you'd like to see covered in the comments. Also, make sure to check out techtutoring.ca to see what, what other topics are on offer. And if you're interested in some one-on-one -on -one lessons, please get in touch with me. I'm more than happy to help you or your children increase their knowledge levels, or your knowledge levels, in topics such as Linux and open source software, networking, database and directory service, virtualization, programming, and much more. But yeah, hope you had a good one, and uh, I'll see you next time.